When this bat cries out into the night, it's listening for returning echoes, echoes full of information, information about obstacles and the precise 3D position of its prey. And it's easy to appreciate that to understand a bat's world, we have to look through its senses because the way they gather information with echolocation is so foreign to us. And it's a strategy that allows some truly remarkable behaviors. And this, this basic idea that our senses do not give us full access to the natural world applies across systems. When you look at this flower, you don't see the ultraviolet components. And we have to model what a honeybee might see, let alone the four cones of a hummingbird eye. And when I film this moth being attacked by a bat, either in the darkness of my lab or the darkness of a dense rainforest understory, we have to use special night vision cameras because its world of information is entirely acoustic. And that, that acoustic assault with echolocation has produced some spectacular adaptations in prey, like these long tails that trail behind this moth. Our team has shown that those tails reflect sonar in such a way that they fool the bat into attacking the tails instead of the body. They sometimes get ripped off. And almost 50% of the time, the moth gets away with this sensory illusion. And echoes are not the only thing that bats listen for. There are whole groups of bats that listen for the subtle movement sounds of their prey to hunt. Like this pallid bat that's coming down to a speaker in my laboratory playing insect walking sounds. And these subtle sounds of nature, the rustle of a predator, the location of a next meal, these are the pieces of information that, that stitch ecosystems together. And in order to extract that information, animals rely upon quiet background environments. This is a sound picture of an entire day. Frequency is on the vertical axis, which you can think of like pitch. And time is on the horizontal. There's two hours on each row, 12 rows. So corner to corner, it's a 24-hour picture of sound. And it's scaled by color. The warmer the color, the louder it is. And, and this recording is of Glacier Bay National Park. And there's a little bit of wind, but other than that, there's almost no sound in this environment. And it's those quiet acoustic conditions that allow really phenomenal behaviors, like this sawwet owl coming down to hunt mice and looking incredibly cute doing it. <laughs> My lab has found that both pallid bats and sawwet owls are significantly impaired in their ability to hunt in noise. And that's quite troubling because the world is getting louder. This is another protected area. This is Rocky Mountain National Park. And it's near a major road, but you can see that traffic noise inundates the entire day. And even when the sound level has increased a very small amount, three decibels, which is a level that humans can barely tell as louder, reduces how far an animal can hear by 50% from that outer dome to the next dome in. And the footprint of a single vehicle on the landscape produces noise exposure many times that level. This is a model of a vehicle in Glacier National Park, and that's an almost five kilometer sound footprint. And strikingly, more than 80% of the land area in the United States is within around a kilometer of a road. And as I've said, this permeates our protected areas as well, those places we set aside. This is Grand Teton National Park, and it's a relatively lightly traveled road. Only about a thousand or more car pass by events here. But the interesting thing about this picture is it was recorded the day before the government shut down in 2013 due to the inability of our legislators to agree. And here it is the day after when visitors were not allowed in the park. And it's these conditions that life evolved in these quiet background environments. My lab has been studying noise pollution at Boise State for about seven years. 
And we've done a lot of our work on songbirds, which are clearly animals that depend upon sound for their life. And we've focused on migration when their life is streamlined. Their number one job is to pack on weight for the fuel uh, for migration. And then their number two job is to avoid being eaten. And we've partnered with the Intermountain Bird Observatory in the foothills just outside of town, where they've been monitoring migrating birds for more than 20 years. And we strapped about 30 speakers to trees and created a phantom road. So it's a road that's just the noise component, no chemical pollution or direct deaths from collisions. And that work has shown that more than 25% of birds avoid that noise. And we turned the noise on and off in four-day blocks to let the waves of migratory birds come to us. And some species would leave entirely when the noise was on, come back when it was off, and then leave again, and so on. We also used fine nets to capture almost 10,000 birds and look at their body condition. And we found that their body condition was significantly worse in noise. And remember, that's a bird's number one job during migration, is to pack on fat for that fuel south. And our work, along with dozens of other labs around the world, has now convincingly shown that noise is an ecological pollutant. It changes animal behaviors and distributions. It degrades habitat quality, and it even impacts the ability of animals to successfully rear their young. And the world is getting louder. This is a map of the United States with estimated sound levels from the National Park Service, the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. And that team, along with their collaborators, have shown that two-thirds of protected areas in this country experience a doubling of background sound levels compared to the natural ambient conditions. And 20% of protected areas. And remember, these are the places we set aside for, for us to enjoy nature and for wildlife to survive. 20% of those places experience a tenfold or greater increase in background sound level. But it's not just the acoustic environment that's changing. Maybe the most reliable and oldest source of information on our planet, the cycle from night to day, is disappearing. This is a model of night sky illuminance across the globe. Light pollution, artificial light at night, has been shown to affect a lot of different animal behaviors. And it messes with timing. Birds lay their eggs sooner, they sing and forage later, it, it changes their sleep patterns. But if we look at it from a human perspective, about 80% of humanity lives under light polluted skies, and 99% of Europeans and 99% of North Americans live under light polluted skies. And if we look at North America alone, 80% of us cannot see the Milky Way from our home. And these naturally dark places are the venue of an ancient arms race between echolocating bats and insects, one that's waged for at least 65 million years. And if you look close, that's a double backflip that that <laughs> red bat is doing. My lab has been focusing on how lights affect bats and insects in Grand Teton National Park for the last few years and our data is in line with decades of work from Europe. The bats that fly high are attracted to lights, likely because their insect prey are as well. And bats that fly within the forest and catch prey off the ground tend to avoid lights, meaning our estimates of habitat availability, how much land there is for these animals, are likely gross underestimates. But perhaps the most troubling thing is the way lights attract insects. They appear to mimic celestial cues, mimicking the moon and stars. They trick these insects into being attracted to lights, and then they find themselves trapped there. In fact, we use this strategy to catch insects for basic science research. This is from a recent expedition to Madagascar, where we're drawing in thousands and thousands of insects. And we're doing this with a work light that you can buy at Home Depot. 
And when insects are attracted to lights, they find themselves easy prey to bats. In the morning, they find themselves on unnatural substrates where they're easy prey to birds and lizards, where their eggs will soon perish. And they often simply die from exhaustion, like these mayflies. And it's absolutely critical that we understand the role of light pollution in these declines because they appear to be real. The data is scant, but where it is good, it's troubling. In Germany, there's a 27-year data set where it's recently been documented that 75% of the biomass of aerial insects have gone missing over that time. There's been a decline of 75%. So we have to focus on what are the role of, of lights in these declines. And this idea of looking through animal senses to try and understand how our alteration of the sensory environment is changing things and affecting the natural world will undoubtedly reveal pollutants we've yet to seriously consider. For example, recent compelling research indicates that the ability of migrating birds, ability to sense magnetic direction, and ability shared by almost all migrating animals is compromised by the electromagnetic noise from our electronics. And we do not know how this works yet mechanistically, nor do we know the spatial extent of that pollutant, but it's clearly imperative that that we find the answers to these questions. Because there is a lot of hope, because these are problems that we can solve now. For instance, if we put noise walls or leave vegetation along roadways, we can prevent the cast of noise onto adjacent natural areas. We can build roads smarter. We can save the last of our quiet places. And we can build roads of quieter surfaces to mitigate this pollutant. For light pollution, we can use red lights, which have been shown to attract far fewer insects and bats, and bats that avoid lights do not appear to avoid these red lights. In Grand Teton National Park, my team is installing experimental lighting in the largest infrastructure in the park, Coulter Bay, so we can switch the lights back and forth from white to red in three-day blocks to try and test if red light returns that area to natural darkness in the eyes of bats and in the eyes of insects. And looking through the senses of other animals will give us the tools we need to save biodiversity, to protect nature and our connection to it. And if we are to do so, we have to look at the world through more than just our eyes. Thank you.